Bibles, John chapter 17. We'll remain standing to hear God's word. This is verses 24, <clears throat> excuse me, through 26. This is the end of the series in John chapter 17. These are the words of Christ. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is God's word. Amen. Let's take our seats. Go ahead and keep your Bibles open to that uh, passage, John chapter 17. As Eric has said, this is uh, the final in our series in this uh, chapter, and we're looking at these uh, last few verses that Eric just uh, read out. I did want to say, um, as, we, uh, as we sort of get going, how appreciative I am of all the musicians and the range of different uh, people here, different age ranges, and uh, the choir as well. It's been wonderful. And also to uh, Laura and uh, Chris Jones, Laura's uh, testimony uh, this morning. It's wonderful to hear about God at work in our community. You know, one of the advantages that I have uh, is that I hear a lot of all that God is doing, and it really is uh, remarkable. I heard in the last few weeks just of a couple of people who've come to faith for the first time, and uh, one of the things we want to do as a congregation is give you a chance to hear some of the stories of what God is doing. And obviously, you hear from uh, people like me and Pastor Eric, Eric K and Eric C, you know, all the different Erics we have on staff. Um, and uh, to hear from pastors, but we also want to hear, you know, from non-clerics, you know, sort of real people um, uh, as well. And so I'm very grateful to hear that. It was encouraging, and um, I'm sure it was, I hope it was encouraging uh, for you as well. Well, well this is the, the last in our series in John chapter 17, and uh, we're actually in Jesus' final request, his last request, the last thing that he asks. So first of all, you may remember, Jesus asked that uh, he would be glorified, and we looked at that, you remember. And what an amazing thing for someone to pray. Can you imagine being in a prayer meeting and hearing someone say, Lord, glorify me? You'd be out the door pretty quick, wouldn't you? And yet Jesus prays that way because he's saying that he's God. And if you're here thinking about whether you believe that Jesus is God or not, or you want to witness to someone about that, you say, look, when Jesus prayed, he prayed that he would be glorified. He, he understood that he was God. And this is one of the many ways we can see that in the Bible. And then you remember, we uh, looked at how Jesus uh, prayed that we would be kept, that we, his disciples, would be preserved, that we'd be pr protected. He wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. And that would have been a challenge for his early disciples of the Roman Empire, and uh, all the pressures they felt, and it's a challenge for us too with all the pressures we feel from uh, the uh, media around us, from different ideologies, and if we're going to be holy, we need, we need help to be holy, and he's praying that we be kept. And then he prays for us to be holy, and we looked at uh, Jesus' teaching here and that is in his prayer about the right methodology for holiness and how to go about it, that it's an internal work of Christ, not just simply an external conformity to you know, a list of do's and don'ts, but actual real transformation that takes place by Christ through faith, by his spirit. And then when you really are a Christian, now you work out what he's working in. And we need to put effort into it. And it's hard work becoming more holy. And we... We looked at that as well. And then last week, we looked at Jesus' teaching about unity, how we are uh, to be, we are one in Christ, and how we are to maintain and preserve and keep and develop that unity. And that unity comes through His Word. And as we want to maintain and keep that unity, we need to know, go neither above the Word, that is becoming legalistic and adding to it our own rules and regulations, nor underneath the Word and taking away from it and becoming liberal in the way we look at um, the Bible, or licentious or 
removing from the teaching of the Bible, but sticking to what God says in His Word. And then also we saw it's through the glory. That is, Jesus, by His Spirit, as we trust in Him, comes into our heart. He dwells within us. And so if we're to develop our unity, we need to pray that the work of the Spirit would be developed in us and in us as a community, that we'd have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, not bitterness, anger, and strife, but all the work of the Spirit, that we would maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, as Paul says in Ephesians. So now we come to the final uh, instruction that Jesus gives. And this, uh, the, the request that Jesus makes. And this request is, uh, that, uh, is about love, that we would experience divine love. He begins talking about love in, the, in verse 24, and then he concludes talking about love. And the whole theme of this section is about love. But how important that is that we get it right. You see, today, we tend to think of love as uh, purely about a feeling. Um, we feel loved, therefore we are loved. Or we don't feel loved, and therefore we're not loved. But that, the Bible, that's not a biblical way of thinking about love. But that is how our culture thinks about it, and so it, infect, it, it affects us and influences us as well. Do I feel loved, therefore I'm not loved? We tend to think like that. Uh, we also uh, tend to um, think about love as if it was something easy. I think this is pretty predominant. It's like we, you know, everyone says, ah, oh, you've just got to love them, as if that was easy. It's not easy. It's hard. You know, I, I think I've shared a couple of times that I almost get a little edgy inside when I'm preaching on love because pretty much every time I preach on love, someone comes up to me afterwards and says something really unloving. <laughs> and yet, it's because I think we think it's easy. It's, it's not. It's hard. And then most, most promulgated, most commonly today, there is this idea that if you love me, you cannot disagree with me. That if you love me, you must affirm that whatever I believe and whatever I do is okay. Of course, what a huge confusion. Someone's stuck in a house with, on fire and doesn't see the fire and doesn't think there is a fire. Would it be loving to affirm that there is no fire? Of course not. And yet in our culture today, and it's increasingly influencing the church, even the evangelical church, there's this idea that, you know, we just got to love people around here. As if that means we don't need to stand up for what's true. Of course, biblically, those two things go together, love and truth. And so it's an important matter we got right, we get right, perhaps most importantly, because we all want to be loved. It's one of the main reasons, of course, why people come to church. We want a sense that we're in a community, that we are accepted, whatever color, um, whatever we've done, whatever class, whether they have a lot of money or not much money. We want to go to a place where we're just loved. And so important that then we get this right, this experiencing divine love. Well, Jesus here is uh, praying about that, and he has, if you're taking notes, uh, just really two elements in this concluding, in concluding part of the prayer, just two elements about love. And the first you'll find in verse 24. Jesus says this, Father, I desire, though literally it is, I will, so he's not simply saying, I desire, I hope it would be the case, maybe. He's saying, I will. It's his will. And it is guaranteed. This is his will, the will of Jesus as God. I will. I will that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. He's talking about heaven that we will be with him 
where he is. He's looking ahead to his glorification when he's in heaven, and putting himself there that they be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because, and here's the foundation for it all and the cause of it all, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So what Jesus here is saying about love, he's saying that love, as uh, John puts it in uh, 1 John in his letter, he says, God is love. What Jesus is saying here is that the essential nature of love is the essential nature of God. That love is the eternal triune, three in one, triune nature of God. Uh, look with me how he gets there. I will, so it's guaranteed, so we're to think of um, Romans chapter 8 perhaps, where Paul is reflecting on how nothing can separate us from the love of God. Those whom he has called, he has also justified. Those he justified, he's also glorified. It's guaranteed, it's done. If you're a Christian, he wills that you be with him, and you will be. I desire that they also, look at that in terms of his understanding of heaven. We often think of heaven as an individualistic experience. It's just me and my God. But here, heaven is a community experience. Heaven is where all the saints, that is, all real Christians across space and time will gather. That they also whom you have given me, this is the Father God's will too, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory. Now that's what heaven's about. Heaven, it's about being with Jesus and seeing his glory. You know, heaven, you know, sometimes if, you're not, if, if someone's not a Christian and they're saying, I, I'm, I'm wanting to go to heaven, but they, they're, they're rejecting Jesus, they're wanting something they've already rejected. Heaven is about being with Jesus. That's what heaven is. That's the heaven of heavens. Being with Jesus. He says, to see my glory. Paul says in his letters of Colossians, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. We'll see his glory. The glory which God the Father has given him, that is not the glory that he had before the creation of the world here, but the glory the Father gave him, which is, John says, the beginning of John's gospel, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. That is the glory of the incarnation, Jesus as God-man, that then was most revealed at the cross. The second half of this book of John's gospel was all about the glory that we revealed counterintuitively, surprisingly, when Jesus dies on the cross. That's the moment of glory when he dies for the sins of the world. That now then in heaven, as he dies and rises again, he's now in heaven and fully glorified, the Lamb of God with the scars of the cross still on his hands, showing his love. And we'll see him. Because, he says, you love me before the foundation of the world. The Father's love for the Son before the creation of the world, before the very beginning of time and space, before the foundation of the universe, the Father's love for the Son, and theologians are often reflected on this, that the Father's eternal love for the Son, the eternal love, because it's an eternal and an infinite love, is another way of talking about the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect love from eternity past, that love fully revealed at the cross, his great love for, for sinners like you and I, to eternity future, and we'll see him and be with him. This is what... Um, Paul uh, teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, his great hymn to love. He describes all the different gifts and all the different things that people have, but the greatest of these, this triad of virtues, faith, now these three remain, he says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Why? It's the greatest because in heaven there'll be no need for faith because we'll see him. There'll be no need for hope because hope would have been fulfilled, and all that is left is love. 
one theologian said, heaven, therefore, is a world of love. Eternity past to eternity future, in the very nature of God, the eternal triune God, as John in his first letter says, God is love. Now, here's the thing. The biggest reason why we don't get love is because we don't define it or think about it in these ways. We think about it as a feeling. And therefore, our sense of God's love goes up and down depending on our feelings. And our feelings are as permanent as whether we ate a good burrito last night or not. Or we think of love in terms of whether someone else loves us. You know, I, I'm, I'm not really loved because that person doesn't love me or this person doesn't love me or that person says something nasty about me and it affects us, of course it does. You know, the phrase sticks and stones may break our bones but words will never hurt us is, is absolutely ridiculous. Words do hurt us, it does hurt us. But it shouldn't throw us off from thinking that we're loved because according to the Bible, if we're a Christian, we are accepted in the beloved. If you're a Christian here this morning, you're secure. He, he will secure eternally. You're loved. And, and you think when you, you, you begin to reason and reflect and feel along with what Jesus is teaching here, you think, what else is there to say? We're now in glory, beholding him face to face. And yet Jesus is ever practical. And so in the second element, he's then moving on to experiencing that love. And this is verses 25, 26, which is now not about eternity, past and eternity, future. It's, it's now about now. Verse 25 and 26. Note how this is constructed. Note the repetition of a particular word here. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known. That the love, returning to the main theme here of love, that she began and now concludes this section, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. He's talking about experiencing this eternal triune love, experiencing that love now. You can see that through the emphasis. Ancient texts didn't have the same ability, of course, as we have with a computer to kind of bold a word or put a heading and subset it into paragraphs. So one of the ways they emphasized the main idea it was the beginning and end of the section. We saw that with love at the beginning and the end. And then also by repetition. You can see here what is repeated over and over again, this word, that even the world does not know you. I know you. And these know you, that you say, I made known to them your name, I'll continue to make it known. It's something that we're to, to know, not merely to feel, and not merely to intellectualize, but to know, for sure. How? That the love with which you have loved me, the, the love from before the foundation of the world, that love, wow. the love of which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Christian, that's who you are. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, where he says there that God has poured his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, the Spirit of Christ is within you and the Spirit is poured out, pressing into the corners of your personality the truth that you are loved despite all the contrary evidence you might feel or sense from other people or from your own ego or personality problems or whatever it is, he's pressing into the corners of your personality. You have been loved, that you are loved. Christ in you, 
by his spirit. Now, of course, when we think in these kind of terms, and as I have been thinking this week, you immediately begin to say to yourself, well, do I really experience that? I mean, do I actually experience that? And so the question I've been asking myself this week as I've been studying this and thinking about it really is a two-part question which is, as we get to the end of this, which is why do we sometimes not experience that? And how can we experience it? So why do we sometimes not experience this eternal, triune, divine love? Why do we not experience divine love that Jesus is talking about? I think, first of all, often because we have the wrong idea of love. We, our culture doesn't say God is love. Our culture really says love is God. And it worships, therefore, its own idea of love and redefines God by that idea rather than defining our idea of love by God. We've got the wrong, it's not this eternal triune before the found, uh, we, we've put love and truth at war with each other. We don't, think, we don't think of God as holy and awesome and majestic and filled with justice and wrathful against sin and yet also love. So we, we, we think of we have the wrong idea about love. We have the wrong idea about God. There's one French philosopher who was reflecting the idea that you know, he, he was a, not a very moral person. He'd done a lot of things that were wrong. He, he'd, he'd committed a lot of sins. And he, he, he was saying, well, it doesn't matter. God will forgive me. It's God's job to forgive. A lot of people have that attitude. We have a wrong idea of God. It's like we've defined God by our idea of love. He'll just forgive everything. It doesn't matter. But that's not God. God is also just and holy. And yet he also loves. We also often have a wrong idea then about ourselves. If there's one great heresy of our day that is most common, it is the idea that we as individuals are basically good. And therefore, anything that we feel, anything that we desire, must be good and should be affirmed. Our, our attitude is almost like, you know, when you hear a preacher saying God loves you, our attitude is almost like, you know, in the culture around, our attitude is almost like, well, of course he loves me. I mean, who wouldn't? And yet the Bible's idea of humans, so we're made in the image of God, of great dignity and worth, and let no one deny that, and yet also broken. And our warrant, that's your real experience too, certainly mine. So the Bible thinks about it quite differently. It's the great uh, Welsh Christian leader, William Rees, in a hymn that is sung quite often in England, I don't know how often it's sung over here, uh, talks about on the Mount of cru uh, Crucifixion, that is where Jesus died on the cross, on the Mount of Crucifixion, perfect peace and justice kissed a guilty world in love. Well, now your mind's blown. He kissed a guilty world in love. But probably, you know, pastorally, most frequently, the reason why a Christian doesn't experience that divine love is because there's some sin. Now, we all battle with sin all our lives. Uh, that's the Christian life to fight against sin. But there's some sin that we're holding on to. It's our precious sin, to use Tolkien's language. My precious. It's our darling sin, as the Puritans would talk about it. 
They'd say, there's a darling sin. You'd love that sin. And of course, of course you don't experience much about the love of God then because He isn't pleased by that. And He wants you to turn from it. And the thing to do, therefore, is to repent of that sin and say to God, God, please help me. I don't want to be like that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to know your love. I want to experience your love. Will you please help me? You turn from that sin. And then the Holy Spirit, God, has poured into our hearts His love by His Spirit. That can be your experience again. Well, that's why not, why we don't experience this love. How can we? experience this love? Well, first of all, we can experience this love by having Jesus in our hearts for the first time. You know, every time we get together as a church, um, there have already been several conversations I've had like that this morning with people after the service. Every time we get together, because we open the Bible and teach from the Bible, there are people who want to find out what the real biblical Jesus is about. And they're here and they're looking for that. You know, you, you go outside and someone says, will tell you, you know, I feel that God is like this. You know, my Jesus wouldn't say that. And we're all thinking, I don't care what your Jesus would say. I want to know what the real Jesus would say. And they want to find out. Maybe that's you. If that's you, then receive Christ. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me and he can be in you. But then uh, Christians, and most of us here of course, often don't experience this love because we, we've stopped growing in our knowledge. Jesus here says that they may know, no, no, no. You're not going to know more about the love of God if you don't grow in your knowledge of God. Uh, read the Psalms. Uh, reflect on Romans chapter 8, where, where Paul talks about this, this love of God that, that you will be never separated from. Grow in your knowledge of God so that you might grow in your knowledge of the love of God. Listen to biblical teaching. Keep coming back every week. If you want to experience divine love, you've got to grow in your knowledge of the love of God. And to grow in your knowledge of the love of God, you need to grow in your knowledge of God. But then, and finally, most importantly of all, in order for a Christian to experience divine love, we need to tell ourselves the truth, to tell ourselves the truth about ourselves. You know, the devil comes along and he whispers in our ears, you're not wanted. They don't want your kind around here. You don't fit in. Look at what you've done. Call yourself a Christian. And then we need to tell ourselves the truth. That before the foundation of the world, the Father loved the Son, and Jesus wills that we would know that love. And indeed, He chose us before the foundation of the world in that love. And that you are loved. That you are accepted in the Beloved. That nothing and no one can snatch you from His hand. And you're His and you're secure, and you're safe. And therefore, of course, now with the love of which you have been loved, you can love, love one another. And now you have a message to share with other people, the love that has been poured into your heart, overflowing to the world around, just like God's love does for the world too. all for the glory of Jesus, which glory we will see. <laughs> oh, our Lord God, we do um, praise you for this wonderful prayer of yours. 
and we uh, bow before you in awe and wonder of these words that Jesus spoke and how they're not just profound but practically resonate with us too. And we thank you for it. And especially, Lord, this morning, we pray that we would have that love poured into our heart by your Holy Spirit, that as we have our minds and our hearts transformed by your word, by your spirit, to be more in line with what you teach in your word, that our sense of security will be underlined. And therefore, Lord, our commitment to mission would be um, propelled. If God loved me like this, I'll do anything for him. Oh, Lord, would you raise up more and more people here who feel that way, who sense that way, who say that kind of thing. And, Lord, we do thank you for the security that we have because you will You will it that we would see you in glory. And Lord, certainly we look forward to that day. When together with all those that you have called, we would be glorified. That we would be somehow mysteriously like you, for we see you as you are. And now, Lord... In this world, we pray that we will be in it, but not of it, holy, united, confident because you preserve and keep us, and secure that we are accepted in the beloved, and that we are yours, and no one can take us away from you. Nothing can snatch us from your hand. And so we bow before you in praise and thanks. In the name of Jesus, amen.